Good afternoon and welcome. I want to begin with two introductions. Number one, joining the advancement team as an advancement officer is Dave Barrett. A lot of you know, many of you know Dave from working 20 years in admissions at uh, McPherson College. And whereas I frequently work with our more senior constituency, Dave is going to be working with that group that is 10, 15, 20, 25 years out, trying to bring them into the McPherson College family fold. Also joining us is, is Carlene Tyler. Carlene is the longest tenured employee at McPherson College. <laughs> having served for 40, this is her 40th year. Most of that time has been spent in the registrar's office. And as you've read perhaps in the e-newsletter and other communication vehicles, uh, she is taking on the role of uh, Director of Alumni and Constituent Relations and also will have responsibility in the area of church relations as well. So it's, it's a delight to have both of these, these people working, working with us. Our program uh, this afternoon is presented by Chris Paulson. Chris, if I remember correctly, came from New Jersey originally and his wife, Christy, of course, from, uh, from Iowa. They've been long-term residents of, of McPherson. Chris went through the auto restoration program as a student and ultimately came back to join the faculty. One challenge we've always had in restoration is because we are the only historic restoration program in a liberal arts college, it's not exactly a training ground that one finds in lots of institutions. So we've hired lots of our own and are delighted to be able to employ Chris. Previously, Chris has done quite a bit of work in, in project management, that is the selection of, of cars that move through the educational process and the restoration uh, program and has done some teaching. However, as he shared with me, each year his teaching responsibilities have increased. This year he's uh, teaching full-time in the restoration program, and I'll let him share a bit more about what he's doing at this point. But please join me in welcoming Chris Paulson. Thank you. Um, as Steve said, my name is Chris Paulson. Um, just briefly, I, I do teach in the auto restoration program, which I really enjoy. This is now my 11th year there. Um, I teach, uh, uh, the, we kid the students, they're fortunate to have me for their first class and their last class. Um, in, their, in their four years there, uh, the first class they take is Introduction to Restoration, uh, and I teach that. Uh, so every incoming student, gets to spend some time with me every week. Um, and then I also teach the uh, class called uh, Restoration Assembly Processes, which is our really our upper level class. Uh, and that's just putting cars together for the final time, hopefully. Um, and, and just a lot of the detail work. So those are kind of the two main classes I teach. Um, I also teach uh, research and documentation, um, engine babbitting occasionally on real early cars. Just Try to do whatever they ask of me, <laughs> um, if it's within my capability. What I will do, I'd be glad to answer any questions as we go. Um, I often seem like I'm completely off track to begin with, so stopping and asking a question or having a comment um, won't get me any farther off track. Um, I'll give you a little bit of the history of some of these, um, maybe why I have them. Uh, maybe there's no rational reason why I have them, but I, why I think they're interesting. Um, and a little bit about uh, license plate collecting today, and certainly be glad to answer any questions. Um, my, I guess, antique car interest is uh, old, car, real early cars. Um, the newest antique car I have is 100 years old, um, and they go back a little bit from there. Um, students kid me. With cars, the older and less practical, the more I like them. Um, which is sort of sad but true. Um, so that's kind of where my license plate interests came from. I like the, the early cars, I like the early license plates. How I got into collecting these, um, when I was a teenager, I had a Model T Ford, uh, which I still have, and I pieced it together and restored it um, and was driving it, but it sort of didn't need any more work done to it. Um, but I still enjoyed going to flea markets and swap meets, and um, I was at one, uh, after the Model T was finished with a friend and just 
because it was a nice day and started looking around and I found this license plate. It's a 1913, and, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll try and give everybody a chance to see them. Um, but it's a 1913 New York, uh, not anything really unusual. It's kind of rusty. It's uh, just made out of steel, stamped steel. Um, and it was, it was three or four dollars. And I thought, boy, how could something, a 1913 license plate be only three or four dollars, you know? So I bought it because I wasn't collecting any parts for my car uh, and got it home and started doing a little bit of research and asking around. And they said, wow, that's a good deal. That's worth four or five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> they could have said it was worth 50 cents. Um, so I, I thought, well, well, I'm on the plus side here. Um, and that, it, you know, I brought it home. My father said, why would you buy that? He says, I got a box in the top of the barn. We'll go get them. So we brought them down and he said, well, if you're gonna collect, if you're gonna be spending money on license plates, you ought to have these. So that, you know, one simple one for just a few dollars turned into a box full. Um, and sadly it's gone downhill or escalated from there, I guess. But, but it's how simple things uh, start. Um, what is that license plate worth nowadays? Um, Six or seven dollars. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the right person might give me ten dollars for it. You know, it, it not, maybe not one of my best investments, but, um, and, and part, you know, a lot of that, well, with anything, is uh, condition. It's got a, a drip of green paint from, you know, probably it was covering a, a rat hole on a barn and somebody painted the barn green. And, um, you know, it, it, it's not the best, but, um, but like, uh, it's kind of interesting, New York in 1913 um, had well over 100,000 registrations, or one, one, over 100,000 cars on the road, meaning they made over 200,000 of these license plates. So there's, there's still quite a few out there. That's what makes it not as valuable as others. Um, when, when one of the things I really enjoy about uh, early cars is the history. Um, and one of the th neat things to me about the cars is the manufacturers, everybody had their own idea. I mean, there was no set mold. You know, if you had a new idea, an innova innovative idea, try it, you know? And, and a lot of people, for a lot of cars and a lot of people, it didn't work. They were bad ideas and we know that now, but at the time, nobody knew. And a lot of that carried over into license plates. Um, there were no national registration laws, whereas today the, all, every uh, license plate or license tag has to be six inches tall and 12 inches wide. Um, there was none of that back then. Uh, the first uh, state to issue a license tag uh, was Massachusetts. Actually, I shouldn't say that. In the very beginning, uh, some states issued what they called a registration number or a registration. You paid a fee, they gave you a piece of paper with a number on it, and uh, you had to display that number on your car somewhere. Some people took paint, painted the number on the back of the car, that was it. Um, and uh, actually what New York was the first, uh, before they did numbers, they used the owner's initials. So if I paid my $10 fee, uh, they would tell, okay, go home and paint or display my initials on the car. So I'd have to, I could take paint CMP on the back of the car. That was my registration. Um, other people had ones more professionally made that they could display. Um, and so a lot of, some of these uh, are ones that were homemade. Um, I'll send some of these around if I, if you promise to give them back at the end. Um, <laughs> Uh, what some people did was when they got their number, uh, they went to like a local uh, saddle shop or a harness shop, uh, and the owner would take aluminum house numbers and house letters uh, and rivet them to a piece of leather, and then with hooks on it, so you could put that right on your car. Here, we'll send this one around. Um, The one that's coming around is a, it's a reproduction. I made it. This is an original one, and uh, you're welcome to come up and take a look later, but it, it's pretty fragile. That's why I'm not sending it around. Um, it's actually, I don't know if everybody can see this. It's uh, on the outside is a piece of steel, kind of like a, a giant frame. Uh, and it's actually two pieces of leather sewn together uh, with the aluminum house numbers and house letters, uh, uh, numbers and letters. Um, and just because, you know, and these were expected to be used for years on the car. So uh, they just, they didn't hold up very well. But that was, uh, that was one way you could display that number. 
Jersey? It is. It's a, it's a New Jersey. Um, the one that's coming around uh, could be one that could have been used in McPherson. That was what the M was for. Um, or it could be uh, um, also in some uh, jurisdictions, the M stood for uh, manufacturer. If you were an automobile manufacturer, you had to have a, a, a tag that said so. Um, some of these other ones, I'll just kind of hold up. Uh, these are, uh, and these um, ones that are uh, what they, they call them pre-state issues because they were made before the state required them. Um, so again, this is when you would pay your fee, the state would give you the number, and it was up to you to display them. Uh, this is again just numbers uh, riveted to really like a piece of cardboard. And, and that, was how they, that was how they displayed them. Um, here's maybe even a, a simpler version. Um, again, the, the numbers, and they're just uh, on tabs on a piece of steel um, and, and painted. And it's kind of interesting if you look, um, well, this is a, a New Jersey version, and it's black on silver. Uh, this is new, oh wait, no, that's not the example I wanted. Um, I'll go with this one. In Nebraska, they required light colored letters on a dark background. New York required uh, dark, yeah, dark letters or numbers on a bright background. Um, it, again, varied by state. And you can see there was no um, consistency between size and shape. Um, this one I think is kind of interesting. It's from Nebraska, and it'd be a, a pre-state, what they call a pre-state issue. Uh, like Nebraska, the state did not issue license plates uh, until 1915. Other states, uh, like Massachusetts, they started, when you paid your fee, they gave you the tag. Um, Massachusetts started in 1903. Florida didn't start until 1918. I mean, there, there was no uh, nationwide laws. Um, but this is a, a Nebraska, uh, about 1910, and this is one that would have been state, uh, I'm sorry, owner manufactured. With it, I have this, this is a, um, what they call fiberboard or Bristol board. It's kind of a heavy uh, cardboard, um, almost feels like wood. And what it is, you won't be able to see it, but it's, um, it says 1910, and it says uh, New Jersey, limited motor vehicle use and it has uh, january through no, uh, december here and first trip second trip third trip fourth trip and dates one to 31. so if you were going to visit the state of new jersey they wanted money from you i guess it really hasn't changed um, <laughs> <laughs> so the theory was you could pay your fee and you were allowed to make four trips into New Jersey. And when you did, you were supposed to scratch off the, the uh, month and the days that you were there. The interesting thing to me about this is uh, it was issued, num uh, recognized number 13108 for the state of Nebraska. What that means is somebody lived in Nebraska in 1910, took a trip to New Jersey. And, and I think in 1910, I have a 1910 Model T and that's a long ride. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, today that would be a long ride. I can't imagine back then, but um, I, I think it's just kind of a, an interesting pair to have the two together. Um, other questions, or any, any questions so far? Is there, oh, I'll tell you, I don't know, is everybody seeing? Um, um, wherever I can. <laughs> um, a lot, uh, quite a few um, have come through trades with other people, um, occasionally flea markets and swap meets. Um, there are license plate shows and conventions. Don't laugh, Carlene. <laughs> 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 um, uh, of course, the internet now makes it so easy if, if you have the money. <laughs> um, but uh, just wherever I can find them. Um, once you get, actually, uh, continuing just to kind of wrap up the, the pre-state era, um, some states required that 
you be able to see, or that the, the local constable be able to see the license plate number at night. What they did was they sold, if I can get it out of here. Well, trust me, oh no, there it is. Um, they sold the number in stencil form that you could put in the glass right inside the lens of your lamp. So when you lit it at night, you'd be able to display the number as you draw. I mean, now granted there was only a small wick behind there. I'm not really sure that was that effective, <laughs> but that was another way for them to get, collect a little more registration fee. <clears throat> um, this one's kind of an interesting pair. These are California. Um, not very good shape, but it's a matched pair. It's hard to see because of the condition, but they're both number 77042, and it's kind of a neat uh, stencil California there. Um, anybody want to venture a guess why one is solid and one is a screen? The front and back. Exactly. Um, they, were, they were worried that uh, their car would overheat if you put that in the middle of the radiator. So they offered you this for maybe a little additional fee, put that and then air would just go right through it. And of course your car would never overheat then. <laughs> Blame the government right away. Um, one other, uh, to me interesting, uh, pre-state um, license plate, before the, the state of Kansas started issuing uh, license plates in 1913. Before that, different cities required you to have a registration. And uh, the city of McPherson in, I believe it was 1910, said, uh, we, everybody with a vehicle, we want you to pay a fee. And the first time they said it's $15. Everybody refused to pay. Um, <laughs> the next year they said, well, how about 750? They said, well, that's not so bad. So then they all paid. <laughs> Um, and this was the, the uh, license plate that you got for your, for your fee. Um, and it's kind of interesting, and I should have pointed out, a lot of these are uh, porcelain license plates, the steel on the inside, but then uh, porcelain coated, and then uh, a baked uh, porcelain finish. And um, this one is, is kind of neat. Um, I got it from Larry Kitzel. Many of you probably remember Larry. Um, I first met Larry when I was a student here and, and he was teaching and he came and gave a talk like this on license tags. And afterwards, or you know, in, in my time here, I said, Larry, what are you gonna do with that license plate? He said, what you, you live in New Jersey. And he says, I'm Lynn McPherson, what are you even asking me for? Well, every time I was back in town, I bugged him about it. And finally he said, look, he said, and, and at the time my wife was still a student here, so when I came back, I'd, I'd visit with him and bother him. And he said, he said, I'll put your name on the back of it. He says, I'll tell my wife, Sandy, that when Larry said that when he passes, Sandy can call me. I'm thinking, Larry's healthier than I am. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is, uh, I was grateful for the, for the offer, but um, didn't, didn't seem like a good situation to me. So uh, several years ago when he retired, he called. He said, hey, do you still want that license plate? I said, well, sure. He said, well, um, he said he was retiring and moving to Colorado and said, uh, if I wanted it, we, we could work out a deal. So that was where I got it. And sure enough, when I got it, on the back, there was a sticky note with my name on it. <laughs> True to his word. Um, so uh, to me, obviously, this is a, a special one, but also pretty unique. Um, to license plate collectors, one of the interesting things um, that, that people have figured, I have not figured this out. This is the second largest, by like square inches, second largest license tag ever issued. I, I could not have dreamed, but they figured that out. And also on the back, it's kind of interesting, you, you won't be able to see it, but there's a stamp uh, right in the porcelain that says Maryland Enamel and Sign Company, Baltimore, Maryland. And it was the crane, sold through the crane and company agent in Topeka, Kansas. So these were, I guess everybody made a little bit of money on, no wonder they were $15. They, the sign company in Maryland that made them uh, had to make some money, and then the company in Topeka had to make some money, and then, of course, the city. But that's the that's the story on that one. Um, so early on, there were some states that were uh, issuing their own plates. There were other ones that you had to make your own. Uh, Massachusetts was the first um, state that made their own and distributed them. So you paid your fee; they gave you a license plate, just like today. 
Um, and this one's kind of neat. It's, it's hard to see, but across the top it says Massachusetts or Mass Automobile Register. That was their state thing. Um, and it, it's real bad shape, um, but it's, this you might be able to see. On the back, right in the porcelain, is in yellow uh, numbers, 4-5, which means April 1905. That was when it was made. They would put kind of stencils on the front, and then somebody took either a brush or their finger and put four or five on the back so you knew when that one was made. Um, and it's also kind of interesting, back to me anyway, uh, back then you could buy a registry book that listed everybody that had a, a, a license plate. So if you saw a car go speeding down the road, you could look up number 9897 and, oh, that belongs to so-and-so. And, um, I was able to track down who this originally belonged to. Uh, it was a man in Northborough, Massachusetts, and it was on his 22 horsepower Buick. And I think just kind of the interesting history. It doesn't add any value to it, but I think it's kind of neat to know where it came from. Um, This one, uh, I think, is also, this is from uh, a state. Um, <laughs> limited number of guesses, but anybody want to guess what state? Uh, Connecticut, yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and to me, the, one of the interesting things about this is Connecticut, the likelihood of someone going from Connecticut and getting mixed up in Colorado or California was pretty slim. So they just put the letter C. That was it, I mean. Um, <laughs> And this again is early, it's a porcelain one. On the back of this one, maybe you can see this one's got uh, red numbers, 2-6. So that would have been February 1906. Um, just, I think, kind of interesting how they, they did that. Um, so you've got some states that are making their own license plates. There's other ones that require you to display the numbers yourself. Um, here's what uh, Pennsylvania, this is a, if you lived in Pennsylvania in 1907, uh, this is what you got. Uh, and the leather straps were to hang it over the axle. Um, well, this person probably lived in Pennsylvania and worked in, my guess is, worked in New York. So he had to pay a New York fee, but they just gave him the number. They didn't give him the plate, they gave him a number. And all he did was paint it on the back. <laughs> um, I guess that, that was his, I mean, that was perfectly legal, um, creative, but uh, my guess is when he went home, he put that, you know, and got to turn it around. And Other ones that I, I think are sort of unique. Um, this one is uh, Wisconsin, the W is for Wisconsin, 1912. Uh, this plate is, um, it's got aluminum numbers riveted to it. The back is actually made out of zinc. Uh, in 1910, 11, um, there were huge zinc mines in Wisconsin. They had so much zinc, they didn't know what to do with it. So they made license plates out of it for one year. Um, it, it's kind of unique. In, in fact, I wouldn't recommend taking a bite out of it, but you can look. Um, it's uh, um, unique that uh, it was only that one year that Wisconsin made it out of zinc. And then they said, boy, we're running out of zinc. <laughs> so they went back to steel for the next year. Um, again, kind of staying in the, the teens here. Um, this is a 1915 New Hampshire. This is also 1915 New Hampshire. I didn't cut that. Um, it's, uh, this, if you lived in the state, this is what you got. If you went to visit New Hampshire, this is what you got. So it was real easy to tell that the out-of-towners from all the locals, um, this was this is what you got, um, and again you had to pay a fee, but uh, just to go visit. Um, this next pair is kind of uh, kind of interesting. They're not the best of shape. They're uh, new. Whoops, New Jersey again, uh, 1908, uh, which was the first year the state of New Jersey uh, issued the license plates. And what they are. Um, it's a piece of tin with uh, individual numbers and letters on little tabs, and then they kind of crimp the edges over to hold them all together. So it'd be real easy to make different numbers um, if, if you, you would wanted to. Um, one of the interesting things, it's hard to see, but this round disc here is a lead seal 
on here, and it says um, certified maker's number. So their way of, of avoiding counterfeits and switching license plates between cars was you were required to stamp the serial number or the VIN of your car on there. So when you gave the fee and they gave you the plate, it had, it had to stay with that car. I'm not sure how often they were ever checked, but um, one other kind of interesting thing about these, um, when I bought these, I bought these from another collector. Um, and before I bought them, we, we agreed on a price. And he said, well, before I sell them to you, he said, let me ask you. He said, are you going to break up the pair? And I said, and a lot of license tag collectors, they do that. They, they buy these two, and well, this one's in better shape, so they'll sell this one, and then uh, they'll keep this one and sell this one. And I said, no, I think, you know, they've been together since 1908. I said, I think they should stay together. He said, okay, then I'll sell them to you. Said, well, this is kind of a, an odd conversation. I have cash, you know. Um, <laughs> And uh, he said, well, let me tell you, he said, these, uh, one of the things uh, license plate collectors look at is like these would be considered what they, uh, three digit pairs, because it's number 699, um, it's a relatively low number. And he said, this is the only three digit pair known to exist that's together. I, who cares? Uh, <laughs> at least in my mind. He said, well, there's another three-digit pair, but one person in California owns one, person in New Jersey owns the other, and they don't speak. They can't stand each other. <laughs> and one has it written in his will that when he passes, that one license plate can't be sold to the other person. I said, well, this is these are pieces of tin. I mean, this is not, this is not a matter of national security or anything. And uh, he said, well, as long as you'll keep the two together and make sure that nobody, uh, I said, I'll keep them together and keep everyone happy, but um, these license plate collectors can be an odd bunch. <laughs> that didn't come out right. Um, <laughs> uh, some other kind of interesting ones. Not the easiest to read. Um, but again, uh, like before, this is made for the front of the car. This is made for the back of the car. Um, I didn't do this. I mean, it looks like it probably did, but I didn't. Um, it's hard to read, but down the side here, it's 1-3 for 1913, and then I-L-L for Illinois. It was uh, 1913 Illinois. Um, kind of a one thing about collecting, uh, of course, collecting anything, condition. Um, and what a, what a big difference, uh, yeah, well, a small variation can make. This is, of course, Vermont. And on the back, it says 3-7. So this would be uh, March 1907. Um, and and this, this, what they did, actually, this was used in 1907 and 1908. They started at number one and consecu consecutively numbered for two years. So this, long story short, 1907 Vermont. If this were a 1906 Vermont, it would be a different style, but it'd be worth about $15,000. This is not. <laughs> um, this is worth probably 50 or $75. Um, it, it just that earlier issue, uh, they only made, they made less than a thousand of them. Um, it just, and it's one of the highest, most collectible uh, of the license, but of course one of the most valuable too, but um, this is, I'm perfectly happy with this one. And uh, again, just, you know, what, what different states were doing. I've even gotten a, a few from Canada. Uh, here's one, 1916 Ontario. And it's kind of interesting, it's a piece of tin uh, with a wire frame, and it's just kind of crimped around there. Um, but they, it's all stenciled, they're, they're not stamped or anything. And I'll pass it around, it's really neat. They, they stenciled the provincial crest on there. It's really well done, and uh, this is pretty typical for an early uh, Canadian license place. They didn't survive the winters too well. Um, but I think it's just neat, the, the amount of work that went into it, when every single one of them was handmade and, uh, and stenciled on. So does anyone try to make counterfeit? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and to be honest, that, like those are pretty easy to spot because the new ones are just so nice and clean. But there were so many of those original Canadian ones that there's, you can't read them anymore. So you can really pick them up inexpensively. Um, so like those are, are easy, to, I wouldn't say counterfeit, but to reproduce or to repaint. This one I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, for a motorcycle. Um, and it has a curve for the, meant to go on the rear fender, 
Um, and one of the problems was a lot of different motorcycle manufacturers, a lot of different size wheels, different size fenders, different shapes. Um, so a lot of these end up being hammered flat. I'm not sure if you can see it, but just so it would fit. Uh, and because it's porcelain, it's been all chipped at the bottom and touched up. But um, still, I think kind of neat how they decided that was, that was how California decided to do that. Some were really pretty neat. Uh, this 1910 Ohio, they tried to make it look like wood. They, they changed their color every year, and uh, they tried to wood grain it. I, you have to have a pretty good imagination to say, yeah, that looks like a piece of wood. <laughs> but um, it was only one of uh, 1912 Pennsylvania did the same thing, but um, I think just kind of interesting. Another uh, Pennsylvania, uh, what they did was, um, again, porcelain with a, a seal riveted to it, which would have been stamped with your serial number of your car so you couldn't, uh, nobody could steal it or you wouldn't be able to switch it. This is probably hard to see. It's got this aluminum strip here uh, with three stars on it. Uh, the three stars uh, were not for a general. Uh, it was a truck, three ton truck. They added this here and it was registered to a truck. You had to pay extra because trucks they figured tore up the roads more and they want a higher registration fee to help repair the road. So that was for a three ton truck. You could have uh, one through five, depending if it was a one ton or a five ton truck. That's did Iowa have one? Iowa did, yeah. Um, Iowa uh, started in 1911, uh, so kind of the same time period. Um, I did not, uh, un I should, unfortunately, Iowa, they're neat, but, Nothing real interesting. You know, they never had a porcelain one that makes them collectible. I do have quite a few Iowa, or some Iowa, I should say. Um, one of the ones, when it, what Kansas did uh, early on, when they started in 1913, uh, the state issued, uh, they didn't date them. Um, from 1913 until 1920, you got a new license plate every year, uh, but they didn't date them. They changed either the shape of the KAN on there or the and or the colors and that was how you knew what year it was um, and this one uh, this is 1914 known by the the shape there it's been repainted in fact it's been heavily repaired you can see that not by me but um, but it's, I liked it because it's such a low number um, which makes it a little bit more collectible uh, being a low number this one I, I think is neat it's in 19, 1919 Utah Utah is the only state that begins with the letter U, so that you didn't have to write out Utah, you just put the letter U on it. Um, oh, one thing I, I didn't mention before, um, some city, of course, uh, by the early 20s, all states required licensing and required you to pay a fee. Uh, some cities also required it. Uh, in fact, I'll send this around. So this one, this, um, they call it a watch fob or a dash disc. Um, has a slot, you could wear it as a watch fob, or it also, also has two holes, you could nail it to the wooden dashboard of your car. It's from Cicero, Illinois, uh, vehicle license and the number, and so you also had to have one of these if you lived in the city. Um, pretty, probably a relatively low um, registration fee, but again, required. St. Paul, Minnesota required the same thing. Here's the state issued uh, plate, and then on top, St. Paul, Minnesota, you had to pay additional fee and get that little one up on top there. Kind of a, a, a fun one. Uh, this is a 1928 Oklahoma. Anybody want to guess what the F was for? Ford? Ford, yeah. Most, most people immediately think farm. And, and actually for years, people thought these were farm tags. Um, and then about 25 years ago, somebody found in the basement of a courthouse hundreds of these unused in the original mailing envelope. And on the envelope, they said for Ford use only. <laughs> I think Oklahoma took pity on us Ford owners and charged us less money. And, uh, or maybe more money because we were so privileged to, to drive Model Ts. Um, but it, it actually, it also shows the, the quality control. They would stamp it, paint it yellow, and then take a roller and paint the black on top. This one's never been used on a car. And uh, you can see where they, they just painted them and stacked them up and it got the black from the one on top and on there. These are uh, 1929 Georgia. And 
I don't, I don't want to see, yeah, one is marked front, one's marked rear. I don't know where else you would put them, <laughs> left and right, but uh, that for whatever reason, uh, Georgia thought they really ought to tell people that this one goes on the front, that one's on the back. Were those five, four meant for the county? The first two numbers, were they? For yes, the yeah, I believe these were the county. Yeah, and uh, like Kansas did that, the, the first, num uh, first numbers were for the county. Um, actually, is when, while we talk about um, production techniques, uh, what New York did, the same thing, they painted them purple uh, this year, uh, and then did, um, took a roller and, paint, and uh, rolled the white on it, and it's probably, probably hard to see, but on the back you can kind of see a rusty cross mark. They put them on a rack, painted them purple, uh, and so some spots just didn't get, um, didn't get purple paint on it. You can also see white splatters. I mean, there was just really not a lot of quality control, but that's okay. Um, what uh, some states did, this one's kind of hard to see. This is a Washington, state of Washington, uh, and the uh, orange and black is from 1919. What they did uh, in order to conserve uh, resources and, uh, and, and um, yeah, resources uh, in steel, they added for 1920, they sent you just this porcelain tab. Um, the problem was it has the same number. So everybody had to get their specific tab. It wasn't just a generic one that said 1920 Washington and it just goes on top. It had to match that. And uh, they decided that after one year, that was too much hassle. One of my favorites, actually, it's one of my kids' favorites. <laughs> um, Idaho, they were so proud of their potatoes um, that they put them on a license plate. If you have a good imagination, you can see that that's the shape of a potato with the eyes in it and everything. Um, it, it was one year only, uh, 1928, so it kind of makes it a little bit more collectible. Um, fortunately, they made a lot of them, but that was their big claim to fame. Uh, Tennessee, I think kind of like, oh, I didn't bring a Kansas one. But uh, for several years, Kansas did the same thing. They cut the corner off. This was kind of the more radical one where Tennessee, they made it state shaped uh, before the uh, US government said, no, they all have to be the same size. Some, uh, of course, being from New Jersey, um, I can complain about them and how the government would uh, get money from you any way they could. This is a 1938, New Jersey, um, it's, it's made out of aluminum. Most of them were steel that year. This one's aluminum because it was what they called a clam digger's license. If you had a vehicle, you wanted to drive on the beach to dig up clams, you had to pay them a fee. They gave you an aluminum one so it wouldn't rust in the salt air, and that was what you got. They also had boat license. This one's just motorcycle size, but it says BL for boat license. Um, if you were students of mine, I would give you extra credit if you could tell me what this one was for. It's a 1936, New Jersey, but it's OA. Um, outdoor advertising. <laughs> if you had a billboard that did not move, a billboard on the side of the road, you had to f pay a fee because it was on the road and you got it out. So this was on the, on the billboard on the side of the road. Some of you may remember during uh, World War II with um, shortage of metals, uh, some states went with soybean. This is 1947 Illinois. Um, soybean license plate. And uh, the, the, they always claimed that um, the goats enjoyed how they tasted. <laughs> goats would walk up and eat them right off the car. I can't say whether or not that's true. But I can tell you that most of them today are either in real good shape like that one, or there's a corner missing, or there's half of it missing. But uh, that, that one's made out of soybean. Um, just a, a last couple ones here. Of course, you can get into ones that were never registered, but of course were uh, <laughs> um, kind of advertising ones. Of course, it, all the male students, they argue this. That is, but, um, and certainly uh, license plate toppers. 
how could I not show a McPherson College one, uh, cast aluminum. Um, and the, these, I enjoy these um, because working at the college, we have a foundry and I can copy some of these. Um, but uh, I think they're neat. I mean, then that's a, that's a um, hobby all of its own or a collecting uh, venture all of its own. Just There's some people that just collect these. Here's a similar one, only it's uh, stamped, or not even stamped, it's just uh, stenciled steel from Harrah's in Las Ve uh, Reno. I only have a couple more, bear with me. Um, I think these are neat. None of it, which was uh, Northwest Territories in Canada. Um, this considered the mama bear and the baby bear. This was for cars and trucks. This was for motorcycles. I thought that they were so cute. I tried to hang them up in my kid's bedroom when they were little. I, no. Um, it was worth a try, though. Um, the last couple I have that I think have stories. This is one. It's a 1928 Massachusetts. And uh, in the license plate collecting world, this is almost a, a, a must-have. They're not particularly valuable because they made a lot of them. But it's, uh, on the bottom here is a codfish. Cape Cod, cod fishing, huge industry, uh, certainly in the 20s. Well, they put the codfish on there. And all the fishermen said, that's great, except it's shown swimming away from Massachusetts. <laughs> Apparently, they're pretty superstitious. They said... Uh, that that's a problem. So in 1929, they dropped the fish. They ac actually on the the truck plates they turned it around and made it swim towards Massachusetts. Fishermen still weren't happy to say, "Well, the heck with this. It's not worth the trouble." They got rid of the fish. So that was a kind of a one year only. Um, this one that's nearly impossible to see is uh, 1974 Oklahoma. Um, Nothing particularly unusual. It went through a fire. Uh, in late 1973, uh, all the, the license tags were made in uh, McAllister State Prison. In late 1973, they were getting ready to ship out uh, the license plates to all the registrations in 1974. Apparently, the prisoners rioted and burned that section of the prison down, burning up all the brand new license plates. <laughs> So for 1974, they sent out little stickers like we use today, and they stuck them on the 1973s, and that was it. And this is one that came out of the prison fire. And I think the last one I have is this one. It's probably the most disturbing. Well, I shouldn't say, but it's um, 1980 Missouri, and it's a DAD. DAD stands for Dead Animal Disposal. The, the highway trucks that they scrape up the end, yep. What makes it unusual? <laughs> I, did, I told you it was disturbing, but um, <laughs> probably not. No, and it's been off for a long. I mean, it hardly smells at all anymore. So. <laughs> Boy, that's a good way to end, isn't it? Um, that that's all I have. A big, yeah, I'd be glad to answer questions. You mentioned Oklahoma <laughs> made their tags at the state prison, and I think Kansas did. Was that common? In, in it was quite um, quite a while. It started in the 1920s uh, in some states. They're still being made in some. Um, at least they were a few. Yeah, up until at least a few years ago, and they may still be today. <laughs> It's kind of interesting, Montana was so proud of it that in the 1940s and 50s, at the bottom of the license plate, they stamped prison made. It was stamped <laughs> right in it. Didn't say by who, but it did say prison made on them. How often do states give new plates? Is there any pattern for um, there's really not that I know of. It's usually every probably five years. I mean, some are valid indefinitely. Delaware, uh, there's certain ones that have been used since the 1940s, and you can still use them on your car. Are there some states that still have front and back tags? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would say, yeah, probably every few years the state issues a new one. I, there are no states that issue a new tag every year. So when did they 
1958, um, national government just mandated everybody go to a six by, six by 12 in 58. Doesn't Kansas have a little aluminum tag for one year? Yes. Um, 19, in early 50, 50 I want to say they had a base plate, 50, 51 and two. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, yeah, but yes, they did. That it was just that big. How many tags do you have? Too many. <laughs> Next question. Um, <laughs> I probably only <laughs> seven or eight hundred. Well, there there are some people that have tens of thousands, so. Um, so that makes me look good, right? Um, I, and when I say I don't have a lot of trading stock, um, I have uh, one from every year of Kansas, I have one from every year of uh, New Jersey, I have one from each state for the year I was born. Um, boy, it sounds like I have a problem. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, I do have sort of maybe specific collecting interests, but well, I shouldn't say that because. I take any of them, but. <laughs> do, you, do you have any interest like that that you're presently working on to fill? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, one of the things that actually my uh, oldest daughter and I started collecting um, like antique car or historic vehicle plates, one from each state. Um, that's one that we're, we're always on the lookout for. Um, and then like Kansas, I try to get a new one each year um, that's and anything else that strikes my fancy <laughs> which is dangerous but <laughs> um, actually most of them do I insure them yeah. um, most of they they're actually covered on our homeowners policy I, I asked Several years ago, I saw a bunch of license plates. I said, oh, that's neat. I said, well, but they might be, you know, I picked a number. I said, it may be worth X amount. And they said, oh, up to a lot more than I have. It's covered. I said, okay, let's. <laughs> David. The California, or the tags that went with the car when you sold it. Mm -hmm. That California orange black tag that you bought back in way back there. Stay with the car. Those are, you have the car with that tag on, you know it's. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, there's certain states that um, the, the tag stays with the car. And if it's a car that from the fifth day, mostly 50s, early 60s, um, and if you've got that car with that tag, it certainly adds value. This, this guy is a car tag collector. I, I should have I should have said it. Please correct me when I start going. Uh, if in uh, uh, World War II they had tags also, 41 and uh, 42. With on the end, like the sunflower was 42 and. Do it. Do the <laughs> and I didn't bring too many Kansas because I was afraid somebody'd correct me. When I was... <laughs> no. You're welcome to come up and say, I, oh, I forgot, I do have my, maybe my best story. If, if you don't mind, indulge me just one more minute. These, um, these three, uh, 1914 New Jerseys, um, they are consecutively numbers, numbered, which is pretty unusual, uh, especially from 100 years ago. The owner, uh, the family owned three vehicles. They're, the story I got is that it was a well-off family. Uh, they owned three vehicles. They had a chauffeur. And the chauffeur uh, lived like in the uh, carriage house or above the cars and took care of the cars. Uh, he got the chauffeur got in a fight with the family. The family said, pack your things. We want you gone in the morning. He went in, packed his things, took one license plate off of each car and was gone in the morning. <laughs> and uh, the person I got these from said he got them from the grandson of the chauffeur. So. OK, that, that's my last story, but certainly. Thank you. I do, yeah, um, and and.
trade occasionally. I have a, actually a good friend in Connecticut, of all places, that quite a few of these, I have one, he has the other. Um, and, you know, they aren't going anywhere, but it made it cheaper for us to buy them when, when well, we'll split it. You take one, I'll take the other. And, um, but, yeah, I do go to shows and trade. Sure. Um, <laughs> the probably would be these two, the uh, 1908 New Jersey three-digit pair. Um, they, I paid $400 for the pair. Um, the reason was, um, I, I'm not sure my wife and I were married yet. I know we were, we were together. We, um, there was, a, we, there was a license plate show and it was about an hour and a half away and our friends lived right near there. I said, well, we'll go for the weekend. We'll stay with our friends. It'll be just fine. Um, well, this one and a half hour trip turned into about five hours because of a snowstorm. Well, we got there and I, you know, we stayed the night and the next morning, the friend and I were gonna go to the license plate show. And um, she says, you know, we just traveled five hours in a snowstorm. You better buy something. So this is what I bought. <laughs> <laughs> she has never said that again. <laughs> that was also before kids. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that, that would be my the ones I paid the most for. I like some idea what kind of money you're uh, talking about. Yeah, um, I mean, but there's also there are other ones that uh, fifty cents a dollar. I mean, that's maybe one of the neat things about the hobby. You can get into it at a, any level. Um, I mean, there are people that are collecting the, the one I mentioned before that's $15,000. You know, there's other ones that are 50 cents a dollar, and you, you can have lots of them too. Do you catch them Occasionally. Um, try to, anyway. Chris, thank you. Thank you all. And um, sir.